Hello. Well, I'm glad you asked where I am, because I'm not in the forest garden today. I'm many miles south of there. But where am I? And what am I doing here? Perhaps you'd like to watch a little more and find out. It all started yesterday. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure I'm arranging and it's very difficult to find anyone. Would you like to come with me? We are plain, quiet folk here and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing and comfortable things make you late for dinner. But sometimes they're necessary. After a decade of planning and research, then another decade of hard work, I finally created a lifestyle I don't want to break from. However, I'm starting to get itchy feet. Well, itchy wheels in this case. So what better way to cure that craving than to give my new horse box trailer tiny house project its first road trip. Rose with secrets and treasures for everyone's pleasure and Rob's discover, Rob's discovery. Ideally this morning, I'll be hitching up my bow top wagon to a fine filly cob. But alas, I sold my Vardo 11 years ago and bought that yurt over there. I shall have one again one day, but this will have to do for now. It's a Friday at the end of April and the forest garden is looking particularly glorious at the moment. cherry blossom. Hmm. But as beautiful as it is, because I've not left it unattended for more than a year now, when I look around all I tend to see is jobs to do, especially at the moment. I'm going away for a couple of nights, which is as much as I can bear this time. Plus I have work on Monday morning and hoping to return with fresh eyes and a reset and rested mind. My mum, who lives not too far away, has kindly offered to keep an eye on the ducks and chickens for me. And the geese have promised to keep an eye on her. Hello. Hello. I'm going on an adventure. It's time to saddle my 62 year old mechanical steed and head 60 miles or so southwest along the coast to my favourite place in the world.
away to dance and sing the summer in, for tomorrow is the first of May. <laughs> Sixteen hours or more each day upon the land we toil. We plough and harrow and sow the seed into the sleeping soil. Now spring has come to chase away cool winter's icy grasp. So drink your beer, be of good cheer, for summer is here at last. Join up and and together we'll make our way To dance and sing the summer in For tomorrow is the first of May The colds took Billy Matthews One bitter winter's morn Sixty years of labour on the land was all he'd known. No sons to carry on his name, no wife to shed a tear. So Nearly there now. Now that summer is almost here. Exmoor, a rich mosaic of wild and remote open moorland, deep oak wooded valleys, high sea cliffs, and fast flowing streams. These dramatic and diverse habitats provide homes for a vast array of species, including majestic red deer, elusive otters, and some of the UK's rarest butterflies and bats. I'm heading to a teeny tiny place just before all that, Horner Corner, a little out of the way campsite, a mile or so from the mouth of the babbling river Horner. There we go, all set up. I had to put everything on the floor that was on the walls, lest it jiggle around in transit and get broken. But it didn't take too long to get set up. There's my kitchen area. There's the wood burning stove and all the wood burning paraphernalia that goes with it. The extendable bed, the storage area above the bed, and I tried to switch the 240 volt electric on just now that runs from an inverter under the bed that um, comes from a battery charged by the solar panels. It's exactly the same setup as in my yurt. But when I switched it on, nothing happened. And I checked the fuse in the double plug and it was blackened. So I need to find myself another 13 amp fuse so that I can charge my telephone up and have the electric lights on in here. But fortunately, I have these lovely fairy lights that are battery powered from little AA batteries, which I far prefer to this big harsh light above actually. Plus, it's a good excuse to finally light my gimbaled Victorian paraffin lamp. Isn't that a beauty? Now, I am desperate to go and explore the wild woodland over there. But it's been a long drive and a long day so far. So first, a cup of tea. I'm glad I brought some water with me. Now, 
I'm not quite sure what I'm setting out to find. But there's nothing quite like looking, if you want to find something. You certainly usually find something, but it's not always the something you're after. A short walk away through the woods is the coastal village of Porlock, the gateway to Exmoor, sandwiched between the rolling hills of the Exmoor coastline and the sea. The streets twist and turn between characterful cottages, shops and galleries, pubs and tea rooms. The perfect place to find my first holiday snack. Exmoor really does have its own microclimate and the weather here is constantly changing. And this road here to Porlock goes ever on and on. Not that I mind, mind you. Look at that view. There are no safe paths in this part of the world. Remember, you are over the edge of the wild now and in for all sorts of fun, wherever you go. Nearly there. I can see the sea. It's really interesting how, despite the fact that we're now 70 miles further south than the forest garden, in terms of what's growing, it's about two weeks behind. But there are a pleasing number of salady things growing here. There are the obvious nettles that I may come back for tomorrow, and goose grass, and jack by the hedge, and lots of other lovely salady things here. So I must remember to stop by this way on the way back from the beach have some with my tea. Willy. <laughs> More. Goose grass. This is the stuff we used to stick to each other's backs in the playground at school. And nowadays, all I really do with it is harvest it to feed to the geese because they go mad over it. And I'm always in their favour then. But my friend Bryony, who has the forest garden as well, told me a few days ago about another of its properties. And that is for purging one system when you make a cold brew tea from it. So, as well as spring cleaning my own homestead this week, I may try spring cleaning myself. So if I take a little and soak it in water tonight and drink it tomorrow, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Look, where there is life, there is hope. Well, actually, I was hoping to be able to get to the sea where I thought I'd find these, but I should have realized that today is a full moon and the tide would be right in, creating these diverse salt marshes here. But look, look at this. Beta vulgaris maritima, sea beet. I've actually had it growing in the forest garden a few times, but those gluttonous geese always mow the lot because they love it. 
They do a great job of mowing the grass and fighting the foxes away to keep the ducks safe. But, hmm, this year they've undone a good year's work of planting. Incidentally, they're two tomorrow. It's their second birthday, or hatch day, I suppose it is. Uh, May the 1st. And they're supposed to live till about 30. And I don't doubt they will, the luxurious and varied diet they have. But can I tolerate another 28 years of their over-enthusiastic mowing and gluttonous gobbling? Hmm, I miss them a little bit, to be honest. But anyway, sea beet. Let's go and find it somewhere else. There's loads of it round here, because this is right next to the footpath, prime dog walking territory. Hmm, it looks a bit wee-wee laden. They grow all around the coasts and mud flats and sand dunes and shingles and along field edges. And they'll grow quite happily away from the sea as well, like in the forest garden. But here, where they have salt water, they've got a moorish, deliciously mm, salty crunch to them. Whereas in the forest garden, away from the sea, they've just got kind of a bland but zingy spinach-like taste like most leafy things in the plant world. Now, seeing as I can't get to the sea as I wanted to, I'll just pick a handful of these and then be on my way and take them home to cook. Now I can. Scary. Exciting. some fine looking cloud mountains. And anyone who saw the very first video I made, Springtime Comes to the Forest Garden, will know what I'm talking about. Although it's not difficult really, they're just <laughs> clouds that look like mountains. I just happen to like them a lot, that's all. First hawthorn blossom. It really must be May. That is so divinely sickly sweet. It's almost as good as apricot blossom. Almost. Hello girls. I might join you there. <laughs> I was gonna make a joke about <laughs> whipping out my proboscis then. <laughs> heard of something called the edge effect. I hadn't either until I read a book by Maddie Harland that's specifically about that. 
well actually I say I read it, I actually listened to it. And some people tell me that's not the same thing. But that's besides the point. The edge effect is the ecological phenomenon where you get overlapping adjacent ecosystems, like where woodland meets grassland, or for example, water meets dry land, like here on the coast, where the sea meets the land. And the idea is that at the edge of these overlapping ecosystems, not only do you find species that are specific to both, but also unique species that have learned to adapt in that transition zone between the two. And not just plants, but animals as well. It's something you can replicate on your own land or in your own garden, just on a much smaller scale. And walking along here, on this footpath next to the beach, there is so much more diversity than, than elsewhere around here, than I've seen so far anyway. And just in the last 40 or 50 steps that I've taken, there are equally as many species. I mean, edible species. I mean, there are far more, more species than that, but I only really recognise the edible ones. I mean, just walking along here, for example, they're all the ones I've already seen, like the, the cleavers and the nettles and the jack by the hedge. But there are things like elderflowers and rambling roses and hawthorn and, and aquilegia and bramble tips and burdock and sloes, and blackthorn, and stingy nettles of course, and dandelions, and purple bugloss, or bugloss, stitchwort, lots of little flowers that I don't know the names of. Ah, what are you doing here my old friend? It's Artemisia vulgaris, mugwort. Well I didn't expect to see you either. Well, okay. Have a nice day yourself. There's even some watercress just here. There's so much stitchwort round here, but I've got enough of that at home. I grow mine round my perennial kale and perennial broccoli. It makes a very good companion, a very good ground cover for anything brassica based. I was also really, well not hoping, but assuming I could find some ramsons and wild garlic round here to flavour up my food. I just assumed they would be in all woodland, but the only wild garlic I've seen around here so far is in people's gardens. I was considering it snipping off a little bit, but that would be improper. So I'll just stick to the flavourings I can find. Well, there's Jack by the hedge with its zigzaggy edge. The goosegrass, topped up with spring water, then left overnight, will make a mouth-watering melanie concoction for clearing the kidneys tomorrow. This jack by the hedge is such a brilliant little plant and you find it all over the place. It's a great substitute for the traditional bulb garlic. In fact, that's one of its names is hedge garlic or garlic mustard. But it really is something different altogether and rather special. It has such a, a mild herbaceous flavour to it. It really is a great shame that more people don't use it. Apart from the wild garlic, or ramsons, the ones I was looking for earlier, 
this is the only other type of wild garlic that I know of, in this country at least. And the difference between the two is that ramsons, you can eat the leaves and the bulbs, whereas these, it's just really the tops that are worth gathering. But they really are worth it. It doesn't quite possess the same strong and pungent aroma as its other garlicky cousins, but it's so versatile in the kitchen and it's almost sacrilegious just to use it this way, just cooking it so simply. But, you know, simple cooking. Lazy cooking. could have used far more leaves. They practically reduced down to nothing. But I think we can call that ready. I was gonna be all sophisticated and eat out of a bowl, but seeing as washing up is a bit more difficult here, I thought straight from the saucepan. really good. Moorish, you might say. I would normally put just a twist of salt into something like this, but because of that crunchy, salty sea beet, it really doesn't need it. Perhaps I shouldn't have used quite so much Jack by the Hedge. It was rather garlicky and my tummy's grumbling a little bit. I'm just going for a, an afternoon stroll to explore the area. That's the River Horner down there. I'm hoping this woodland path will drop level with it so I can have a closer look at the water. Crossroads, a metaphorical. more jack by the hedge, although it's jack by the road in this case. I've seen quite enough of you today, thank you. There's quite a lot of burdock growing here too. I keep trying to introduce burdock into the forest garden by spreading the burr-covered little seeds on the ground, but it just won't take. I wanted to do a special confectionery-based forest garden video where I make dandelion and burdock the sweet drink and make real marshmallows from the root of marshmallow and also make things from licorice 
I've got licorice at least, and I've got marshmallows. I just need to wait for them to spread a little bit. Mm. A bit too cold for me. I was really hoping to see some red deer whilst I was here too. But I think that's the closest I'm going to get to seeing any wildlife. Unless I get up really early tomorrow morning. day today. It's the last day in April in fact, which means tomorrow, if you hadn't guessed, you probably should have from the fact that I've been playing that song incessantly. Tomorrow is the 1st of May. May Day. Help me! And many other names it goes by. It's one of my favourite days of the year for many reasons, not only because stinging nettles are at their very best, but because, well, I'm going to read you a story. Now, it's a good way to end any day with a story, but especially today, as this story is about the 1st of May. It comes from a book called Botanical Folk Tales of Britain and Ireland. Well, the islands of Britain and Ireland hold a rich heritage of plant folklore and wisdom and this book is ideal. I've been reading it throughout the year and there's a story for every season. The introduction to this one. The 1st of May is Pinch Bum Day. The 2nd of May is Stingy Nettle Day. It's May Day. Beltane. High Spring. And the plant world is full of energy. Well, that was a happy ending. I was fearing the worst there. Many of these stories about wild folklore do not end happily, but usually only because of the people that interfere with it and mess around where they shouldn't. Well, that's a good lesson and a good story. I hope you enjoyed it. I was going to go for a little dusk wander in the woods but I might stay here, safe by the fire now, and watch the sun go down. Good night. Cozy night's sleep. I should have brought an extra blanket though. Oh, I did bring one. I should have used it. Mm. I'll get up in 10 minutes. Mm. I love this side opening door that gives you access direct to the outside from the end of the bed. Good morning. Oh, it's raining. 
Goodbye. It was a little bit scary having that gap there though, thinking that things are peeking in on you in the night. But then if you just close your eyes really tight, then they can't see you, can they? So you made up your mind to move out of the town Cause it's seen the society's getting you down And a new branch of Lidl's just opened up Round where the park used to be Today is the 1st of May. I can't believe it. One of my favorite days of the year. And it's funny actually, although I'm in this beautiful place, I just want to be at home today, really. But seeing as I am here in this other beautiful place, it's a good time for a walk in the woods again and to find some nettles this time. exactly short of nettles at home, but stinging nettles are such a distinctive and abundant plant that they're a reliable snack wherever you are in the world. Nettles are so ubiquitous and easy to identify. You seldom have to go a few steps before you find them. I'm sure I saw some just here yesterday. Yep, they're the first slot. They're a little bit too low and close to where dogs walk for my liking. I'll go a little further. Aha! I went off wandering in the woods up that way looking for them and here they were all along right behind my encampment. Now nettles really are the perfect permaculture plant. Nettles, Ertitsa diawitsa, are probably the best known wild plant growing in the UK mainly because of the unpleasant sting that we all learn to avoid as children. Many people dismiss the common nettle as a weed, going to the extremes to try and get rid of it from their gardens. Yet, it is in fact one of the most useful and multifunctional plants I can think of. Back home in the forest garden, I allow nettles to grow near anything with a sweet sap that's loved by aphids, like my precious rhubarb, for example, or my rosa rugosa, because nettles they harbour ladybirds that love to feed on those sweet, sweet aphids. Perfect. Now, I'm going to pick a few of these tender specimens. Normally, I use scissors to snip them off. I've bought some very important gloves as well. It can be done without them, but I don't want to take the chance this time. you need quite a few nettles to do anything worthwhile with. But these few handfuls of tender tips ought to be just enough to whip up a batch of soup for my lunch. too small in the horse box to record what I'm doing, 
So, in this makeshift outdoor kitchen, I'm going to create some nettle soup. There's everything I need here in the order I'll need it. It's quite simple. There's some olive oil and then the pre-rinsed nettle tips and the leftover sea beet from yesterday. There are some forest garden potatoes, also six shallots from the forest garden, a stock cube from a supermarket, and also instead of any herbs and spices, I thought I'd use the cheating method of a teaspoon of Marmite or yeast extract to you foreigners. I'm just waiting for this water to boil so I can make the stock because as I only have one gas ring, I've got to boil the water first before I can put the saucepan on. Now in my hurry to get away yesterday morning, I forgot to pack my soup blender. So I've got to chop everything really small so that there are no bits in the soup. Not that that's a bad thing, but that's the way I like it. So, chop chop. Although these shallots aren't as big as that, they've got a beautiful flavour. While that soup simmers, I can relax and think about getting away from the digitalization of life. Although, ironically, I'm recording this on my mobile telephone, so not quite. At least it's on flight mode. Now to try this goose grass infusion. Oh, <laughs> it's not on flight mode. Oops. Hang on. Now to try this cleansing infusion. Cheers. Oh yeah. It tastes nothing how you imagine it would. Although I don't know how you'd imagine it would taste. It is surprisingly melony. Quite a weak melony flavour, but melony nonetheless. It's like watermelon juice. Hmm. It doesn't have a particularly strong flavour, although I'm just craving more and more of it. It's like a it's a Moorish flavour without it's more like a feeling. Yes, I must need it because I feel that I want to just drink it down. And if it wasn't so cold, I probably would in one go. It's making my brain freeze a bit. Hmm. I'm just gonna be bursting with liquid after this and that soup. How's it coming along all the way? My little camping stove ran out of gas, so I've lit the wood burner, as it's going to be a chilly night again tonight, and I finished it off on here. That certainly smells ready to me. Let's give it a go. Oh, an extra one for good measure.
the obligatory bread and butter and cheese. I surprise myself. That is bloomin' delicious. It could do with a tiny bit less marmite. I thought that as I was stirring it in. But that's the amount that I would put in for a huge pot of soup. But apart from its marmitey aftertaste, I can taste the nettles, I can taste the sea beet, and the onion and potatoes. I think I'll be going back for more. Cheers! Mm. The taste of the woods and the sea. He says with his eyes streaming because <laughs> it's so hot. <laughs> I am an experienced soup eater, really. I should have known to dip the bread in first. But I wanted to try it so that you could you could taste it too. Would you like some? Oh, sorry. I don't want any more adventures today, thank you very much. You might try over the hill or the other side of the lake. It was very nice to see you all, but I'm going to have this last night to myself. Good day. Thank <laughs> you.